of you for being here today. It, it shows the commitment that you have to your law practice. It shows the commitment that you have to your cases and your clients and the community. And I know many of you, as Matt has pointed out, are already handling these types of cases. However, if you're not, and even if you are, you're one phone call away. You're one call away from having this type of case. And the trucking examples that Co and, and Matt have, have, have sh shared with you today, again, I want to reiterate the things that Matt said. You know, there's a lot of great and honest defense lawyers and insurance company representatives, and there's a lot of great truck drivers on the road that bring the products to us every day. However, the examples that have been shared and that I'll share today are somewhat typical of what you see in this type of case. And I want to take just a minute to remind everybody and ask everybody to think about and appreciate the role that we all play as lawyers in community safety. You know, we may not think about that day in and day out, that we play a part in helping to make the community safer. We do. You know, you don't have to be a law enforcement officer or a firefighter or emergency uh, medical person or a soldier to participate and help in making the community safer. If you think about it, Goliath, David was a humble shepherd. Yet when he got the call, he stood up and took action armed with the five with five smooth stones that he had carefully selected from a brook placed in his shepherd's bag armed with his shepherd's sling and the invisible armor that gave him the courage and the guidance and the strength to stand up to the mighty Goliath and take that direct shot, that direct focused shot. And that's what we want. That's what we want to do when we get that call. We want to be armed to take that shot. And we want to be ready and we want to, again, appreciate the vital role and the part that we play in community safety. And it's something that I feel very passionate, very strongly about. And I know that Matt and Co and David share that, is that we have to stand up for the community. We have to stand up for our clients, our friends, our families, our neighbors, our colleagues, and let Goliath know, let those insurance companies know that this tort reform agenda, we've had enough. We've had enough. And we demand safe highways, a safe workplace, and a safe community to live. And then if you come in this community, and you come in our community, and you put a driver out on the road, and you put a truck in the, on the road, that doesn't need to be there and you expose us to danger or you create an unsafe work environment because you won't spend the time and the money to train your employees, you won't spend the time and the money to have people and mechanisms in place to make their life and their work and their job safe, then we're going to make you pay. This community, we've had enough and sure, we, vi we value profits, we value money, sure. You know, these companies, they provide jobs. They provide valuable services to the community. But if you value that profit over, over life and you, cr and you put the public and our community at risk, then we're going to make you pay. We're going to hold you accountable and we're going to make you pay. And 
in getting armed for that, I'm going to dovetail and piggyback on some of the things that David, I'm, I'm sorry, Co and Matt have already shared with you. And what I'm going to talk about today is the five smooth stones to success in handling injury and accident cases. And I say injury and accident cases, but the principles and the things that we're sharing today, again, it's, it's, it's no secret, and it's something that can, you can apply in all of your cases. The, the first smooth stone is a game plan, a preliminary strategy for success. And that's something that you need in every case. You need to have a game plan and a strategy. And you want to do, you, you want to develop that as early as possible. But again, these are all, there's no certain order to this. But as soon as possible, you want to come up with that uh, game plan and as the case develops and you get new information, new evidence, you're going to build on that game plan. And an example of a game plan and the things that Matt and Co talked about, you know, really demonstrate the importance of having that game plan. We were involved in a very serious motorcycle wreck case and our client was out at the hospital when I received the call to go see him. And I know, you know, that, may, that might make some people apprehensive and uncomfortable to, to go to the hospital. I hear it and it's, it's fine with me. Um, they're going to call us ambulance chasers and that's fine. That's fine. But when I went to the hospital, I wanted that family to have the information and the knowledge that they could make an informed decision about what to do. And I was able to convey to that family that we needed to get a lawsuit filed and get experts in place immediately. That was the game plan. I was able to share with that family from the experiences that we've had that I know the insurance company is out there working against you. They had already had an adjuster at the hospital walk around talking to family. Do you think that adjuster was there to help them? Chances are no. I was able to share with the family that chances are they're going to have an accident investigator and possibly an accident reconstruction expert out at the scene. While your son is recuperating from surgeries and facing additional surgeries out of work, clearly all indications were at that point it was the other driver's fault. But you have to share with the family that's not enough. And sure enough, we were able to get the lawsuit filed, get the experts in place, get our own investigator, go to the scene with our uh, accident reconstruction person. And sure enough, we find out that the insurance company had hired their own accident reconstruction team. Again, do you think they're doing that to help this man? And like I told the family in the, in, in, in the in, in the hospital room, I know this is the first time you've been through this. None of us really want to think about filing a lawsuit. You know, how many times have you heard that? We're not that kind of people. You know, people apologize for coming into your office to see you, to talk to you about a situation where they've been hurt, and they're apologizing for coming into your office. But, 
you know, there, there's, a t there's a time and place. And in that particular case, we had to get the, the, the lawsuit filed, get our own investigation started, interview witnesses, set witnesses, uh, deposition, get the case, push the case, and get it ready for trial. While the other side is bringing up mediation. And again, you, in, in many cases, you just have to resist that temptation to settle early. You've got to get the case ready for trial, push it for trial. And like I told the family, they can settle with us. They can come over with a checkbook, let us know what the insurance policy limit is, and write a check if they want to settle. But you can't do that until you've got your game plan together, your strategy together, and you properly evaluate the case. That brings me to the second smooth stone. And again, this just dovetails on the things that Co and Matt have shared with you early and thorough trial preparation. Again, go to the scene, talk to witnesses, take pictures, send records requests, find out what happened. What, what you'll find in many workplace injuries and accidents you're going to find that the company is uh, fabricate, fabricating or creating rumors and so forth about what happened, again, to protect their bottom line. We, uh, and, and I'll give you an example of this, we uh, currently have a case against a large lumber mill where a man was down in a, uh, a machine doing welding and maintenance work inside of that machine. It's a, it's a machine that sorts uh, big uh, logs. And he's an independent contractor that comes in to do uh, maintenance work on this machine. Well, apparently somebody comes in and turns the machine on, which results in a gate closing and crushing. And it, once again, just another example of a company that values money and profits over a safe workplace. And what we found out from our um, investigation, our preliminary investigation, uh, you know, led us to, to, to learn what happened. Well, we went out to the scene, we went out to the plant with our expert. To, to review the machine, to review the facility. And one of the things that one of the company lawyers insisted, insisted that we look at, take some pictures, take some video, he had two chains rolled out from the gate of the machine. Here, you know, look at this, look at this. And, you know, wanted to show us that you wrap these chains around and you hook it, and it's an additional safety mechanism to keep the gate from closing. Well, the problem is, you know, we already knew from our investigation that the, the chains that they insisted we photograph and they insisted we video were not the chains that were on the machine at the time of death. The machines, the, the chains that were on the machine were not equipped to hold the gate in the first place and only one of the chains had a latch. Well, we knew that before we went out there. But if you think about it, if you think about it though, how many families that would face a situation like that in a time of crisis at their most weakest point after losing a brother, a father, a son, whatever the case may be, would get that explanation without having a lawyer involved and think, well, it's so sad it was his fault. There's nothing we can do. Now you've got to think about that. You know, that, that is what we're up against. That's what we face. That's why it's so important that we do the work that we do to expose this. And once again, another company, in, in documents, we find out from OSHA documents that this company had been cited for several for, for similar, uh, you know, uh, 
had uh, citations and had been instructed to create uh, safety policies and implement safety policies and procedures years before this happened. And they failed to do it. Why did they fail to do it? I, you know, it's one of those things. That it's, it's, not, it's not profitable. But you can guarantee if they had a million or five million dollars of their money inside that machine, it would be guarded and protected and would still be there today. But because it was a, you know, independent contractor, he should still be alive today. Should still be alive with his family. And one of the things that the, the family wants to see in this case is change implemented at that facility to ensure that doesn't happen to someone else. The, the third smooth stone, and I've, we've already touched on this, is, is recruiting an army of experts. In the motorcycle wreck case that I talked about, we, uh, we hired a life care planner, we hired an economist, and we hired a uh, again, a uh, accident reconstruction expert, all to reveal to us and help demonstrate the liability, the injuries, the damages, in an effort to maximize the value of that case. So it's, it's important to do that and, again, resist the temptation or the thought that this is a clear liability case and we're going to get the rec medical records in, we're going to let the, you know, let the client finish treatment and then settle the case. You've got to go in and prepare those cases for trial. Now, the fourth smooth stone is knowledge of the defense and uh, which correlates and, and also relates to knowing yourself and knowing your case. And again, the way to do that is early and thorough trial preparation. But while that's so important, again, as, as Co talked to you about, when you think about David and Goliath, David didn't go head on and try to face uh, Goliath using the warfare and the, and the tactics of, of that time. He used a, a careful, focused approach to take that direct shot. A, a, as Co talked about, the, these insurance companies, big powerful corporations, they can outlaw you, they can outspend you, they can outpaper you, they make contributions to political, political campaigns, in so many ways, they have all the advantages. I mean, when do you ever get a call about a case in time to go to a wreck scene with an expert and start collecting evidence and start uh, building the case at that point? It doesn't, it doesn't happen. Goliath has all of the advantages in so many ways, except when Goliath faces David, someone that is using a lean, mean, and focused approach, someone that's honest and truthful and truly has the goal and the agenda to seek the truth. And that's where, as Matt talked about with this foliation of evidence charge, you can expose them. But you've got to do the trial preparation to get the documents, to get the witness depositions, to do the things to expose the weaknesses and find the heat in the case. You know, for years, <laughs> for years, I personally thought, you know, if we get a case that has great damages, you know, my client suffered tremendous injury and damage, then that's going to drive the value of the case. And sometimes it, it does. But the things that really 
drive the value in cases. And if you think about it, helps bring about the change in the community from a safety standpoint is conduct of the defendant. Finding the heat in the case. Where is the heat? You know, what did they do or not do that could have prevented this? How many other times have they done it? When you can find the heat that will justify a spoliation of evidence charge where basically the judge is going to explain and tell the jury you can consider the fact that they've hidden or destroyed evidence as evidence of their guilt. That's powerful. Or when you find that heat, that evidence that they had been told to do something about this one, two, three, four years ago and didn't do it. Because what, what makes the studies show, what makes jurors respond is community safety issues. And that's, you know, something that hits home with them, something that hits in their backyard. This could have been me. It could have been a, my wife. It could have been a, a, a family member. Something that they feel like is not an isolated incident. Something that threatens the safety of their community. But think about it. Think about it. That's what we're called on to do. We're called on in this profession to expose things that are wrong and do everything that we can to, to right those wrongs, to, to, to make the community safer. And it's something that we need to take every opportunity that we have to remind big insurance companies and big powerful corporations that we demand that our clients have justice and that their cases be determined on an individual basis based on the facts and circumstances and the merits of their case. Not some kind of generalized, biased, tort reform type propaganda. Now, the fifth smooth stone is shepherding the client. And basically what, what that is about is much the same way that David did a lot of his best work as a shepherd out in the field protecting the flock. As Matt talked, talked about, we have a tremendous responsibility when we agree to take one of these cases to protect our clients and to do everything that we can to shepherd them through the process. Co talked about gaps in treatment and how a insurance adjuster or an insurance defense attorney is going to latch on to those things and say, well, you, you know, your client wasn't that hurt if, he's, if they're not going to the doctor every day. Or I see there's a, a you know, 60 day gap in treatment. You know, they, uh, you know, oftentimes they don't understand that life gets in the way sometimes. They have transportation issues or insurance issues or financial issues, but you have to take the time to get involved and find out what is going on in their life. What is going on with their medical treatment? Talk with them about their injuries. Talk with them about where they hurt, when they hurt, why they hurt. Encourage them, if necessary, to get a second opinion. Help them find, if they don't have medical insurance, help them find a doctor that will give them medical treatment. Because it's, you know, it, it's going to play out if the case doesn't, it's, it's going to hurt the value of the case if it settles. It's going to hurt if, if it settles if it's, it's going to hurt them from a medical standpoint because they're not getting the treatment if they're out on their own for 30 or 60 or 90 days. And they oftentimes need that 
helping hand, that encouragement to take the next step. And, and sometimes that encouragement is getting a second opinion. And we have the opportunity in our profession to know who are the doctors that you should go to to get a second opinion. Or, you know, when you handle a number of these cases, you, you, you will learn about and know, and again, I know many of you already handle these types of cases, but you'll know what treatments work and what, uh, wh where clients have successes. And I, I want to give you an example of shepherding the client. David and I had a young man in the office a couple years ago that had been in uh, a pretty violent head-on collision. And we knew uh, right off because of the circumstances of the case, we needed to go ahead and get a lawsuit filed. So we, we did. And, I, you know, I met with him on a couple, of, on, on more than one occasion. And just because of his behavior, his attitude, his speech, I, you know, I felt like something is not right with this young man. And so I encouraged him to follow up. And again, that's something that you have to do. Get the medical records early and encourage your clients to follow up and take their doctor's advice. I mean, we, we, we take it for granted, but oftentimes it, it's the last thing that's on their mind, even though they're hurting. You know, we've had so many clients that will just suffer. A, 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 you know, as the old saying goes, they'll suffer in silence. But anyway, in this particular case, after meeting with him, he had followed up with his doctor a couple times. And so I put a call in to his stepdad and I said, look, I don't want to be offensive here. And I hope this doesn't, uh, you know, offend you or your family. But what's going on here? Is he always like this? And his, his, his uh, stepfather said, no, this just started happening after the wreck. So at that point, we suspect there may be an, an undiagnosed head injury. So we steered him to a, a psychiatrist and a, a neuropsychologist to do some testing. And, and sure enough, the, the psychiatrist testified in a deposition that the young man had suffered from one of the most serious closed head injuries that he had seen in his 20 year plus practice. Gave a great deposition uh, and, and, and prior to this psychiatrist deposition, the insurance company had not offered to pay one penny. Had not offered to pay one penny, even though their driver was clearly, by all accounts, in our client's lane of traffic. Hit him head on there was never any dispute about who was at fault with the wreck. They did not offer to pay one penny. What did they do? They got on his Facebook account. They talked to people in the community, did everything they could do to show that this young man had mental health issues prior to the wreck. And again, it wasn't until the case was placed on a trial docket and they were faced with the prospect of this uh, psychiatrist that had great credentials testifying that regardless of the behavior before or after that the young man clearly had a permanent closed head injury that would never get better. And at that point, the case was set on a trial docket and we were able to get the insurance policy limits at that point. But not before then. Not before then. Even though it was clearly their driver's fault. What did they do? They went out and they looked for things to hurt the value, take away the value of the case. Again, they're going to take every effort to protect their bottom line. And I'm, I'm going to show some slides here to demonstrate how this comes together. 
And the example that I'm going to give is just to follow up. I know uh, Co and, and Matt have talked about truck wreck cases. And so the example that I'm going to give is, again, I know there's a lot of great truck drivers on the road, and so many of the cases that we see do this, and the information comes back that the trucker did nothing wrong, squeaky clean record, great driver, and just, um, you know, did everything right. But more times than not, you get a case in your office, and you're going to get that call if you haven't already gotten it. You're going to get a call, and the accident report is going to say it's your client or potential client's fault. And the initial reaction and the conventional reaction would be, well, there's, there's no case. But what we found, once you start doing that uh, examination of physical evidence, you go to the scene, you talk to people, you take pictures, you, you do the records re requests, and, and, and review it, spend time with it. Look for the details and, and, and think outside of the box. Now, this is an example of a, a, a physical examination of, of the scene. And you see the skid marks there, and you see the point of impact. And it was determined through the accident report that the deceased pulled out in front of the, the trucker. Well, but again, when you go to the scene, the skid marks, you've got to ask yourself, why are they there? What happened? There's got to be more to it than what was written in the accident report. And so you're going to continue with that investigation. And by the way, at least three other lawyers, at least three other lawyers looked at the accident report and said, family, we can't help you. You don't have a case. And close there. So the family is, is, is desperate at this point, even though you've got skid marks, you know, you've got to look at that. So the next step is to get your expert in and conduct a physical examination. And you're going to be doing an, equi uh, an equipment inspection. You're going to look at the surface of the brakes, the steering mechanism, lighting devices and reflectors, tires and the horn. When that was done in this case, guess what you find? And this is one of the documents that we're talking about you know, taking the steps to, 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 to find. And again, when you get it, you know, look at these things. Get it as soon as possible and look at it as soon as possible. This shapes your strategy. This shapes your game plan. This is where you find the heat. This is where you find what happened. Well, on this report from the Alabama Department of Public Safety, you find that they're operating a commercial vehicle without a periodic inspection. The brakes are out of adjustment. And the significance of the brake being out of adjustment, you look over in the column OOS, and there's a Y beside that. That means that this vehicle, this tractor trailer, this tractor is out of service, which means it shouldn't be on the highway to begin with. Here you, you have a company that's putting us all at risk with a truck that shouldn't be on the road because the brakes are out of adjustment. And again, they're operating without a periodic in, in, inspection, and apparently it, it had expired several years before this wreck. Then you follow down, and the, the brakes are out of adjustment, and the trailer is out of service, because of some issues with the turn signal and the like. So the truck and the trailer are out of service, which again means it shouldn't be on the highway to begin with. Why would they put this truck and trailer 
on the highway. Why do you think? So next you take a look at the load inspection. And you can start that very simply by looking at the photographs. Now, I know very little about truckloads. But the good news is this is not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. You, you can look at inspection logs, but just looking at the photograph, something tells me this, this log trailer looks like it's, it's full. Looks to me like you've got too many logs on, on that. And sure enough, it's 13,500 pounds over the weight limit. And you see the top of it is international paper, and that answers why they would do this. The truck company has, has to meet a monthly quota, or it costs them money. So they're willing to, in order to make that quota, they're willing to put a truck and a trailer on the highway where we're all share that highway to make that quota, to make that money. And I'm not going to show it to you here, but if you take a look at these load logs, these load tickets for a month prior to that, you'll, you'll find this same truck, this same tractor, this same trailer uh, 28 times in 30 days overload. As much as 100,000 pounds overload. So next you take a look at the driver. So we already know that we've got a truck and a trailer that shouldn't be on the highway. So guess what? When you start looking at the driver record, the physical qualifications, and the toxicology, guess what you find out? This driver has 15 speeding tickets, 15 overweight tickets, 10 moving violations, three wrecks, and one license suspension. So you have a truck, you have a trailer, and now you have a driver. She should still be alive. She should still be alive. If they, if, the, if this company valued their safety and our safety, even at the same level with their profits, the lady would still be alive. Now, the, the, the last slide I'm going to show you here is from a different case, but again, it touches on the same things that, that Matt talked about. You know, when, when, when you start asking these corporations to stand up and do their job, and you start pushing their lawyers for information, you're going to get resistance. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to tell you that you're wasting time and money. Oh, why don't we just mediate this thing? Or, you know, your driver was at fault. Or... He should have hooked the chain. You're, you're going to take those hits. And they're going to tell you, oh, you can get an expert to say anything. Well, if anybody ought to know that, they should. And that needs to be your response. If, if they tell you that you can get a doctor or an expert to say anything, you know, it takes one to know one. That's exactly what they do. But you know what they can't hide from? They can't hide from the truth. And they want to keep the truth from the public. And this is an example of that. You start asking for employee files. And the lawyer on the other side, oh, you know, the, the, I don't know what you're getting at there. I don't know why y'all want those toxicology. You know, we, we didn't test him. He, he's, a, he's a pastor. He's a pastor, so we didn't test him. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, he, he, he t testifies in his deposition. Yes, I I've tested positive in the last three months. And I want to go back and 
uh, it, the, with, and this, it, this slide is from, I, I'm sorry, I've got one more to show you. This slide is from the This slide is from, from this wreck. And again, I'm not supposed to drive. Where did that come from? It came from a social security disability application of the driver, the truck driver involved in that wreck. On his social security disability application, he says, I'm not supposed to drive. And again, I would like to, to say, you know, this is a unique situation, but I'm, again, I'm convinced that every one of you are going to, if, if you haven't already, you're going to get that call. And again, we want more than anything for you to be ready and armed the same way that David was ready to, and armed to face Goliath. We want you to be ready when you get that call. And not only for that call, but for all of our clients, all of our cases, the community as a whole. You know, we, we, we've, in, in so many ways, and, and I'm guilty of this, in, in, in so many ways, we've been programmed and we've ha had so much of the tort reform agenda and the, the quote unquote conservative county, conservative judges, that, that's, that's tort reform propaganda. And it's, it's time for us as lawyers to go back and look at the reasons that we became lawyers in the first place. I know that it's something that we decided to do as a calling. And part of that calling, I'm thoroughly convinced, is taking steps to make the community safer to provide a safe work environment, to provide safe highways, and, and to demand that. To demand, we all deserve and, and, and should demand safe work, safe work conditions, safe highways, and at every opportunity that we have, we need to stand up and let Goliath know, again, if you come in our community, our backyard, and you, and you do these things, you put drivers on the road, that shouldn't be driving. You put equipment out there on the highway that shouldn't be there. You, you, you won't take the time and the steps to Im implement the, the proper safety at, at your workplace and you hurt the people of our community, we're gonna hold you accountable. We're gonna hold you accountable. And again, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here. And uh, we, at, at, at any time, welcome the opportunity to talk with you. And again, I just want to thank everybody for being here. We're going we're gonna to take a break. And the, the next speaker is my law partner, David Hogg. And on the break, I would encourage everybody to stop by and uh, see David from Lexus Nexus or the ladies from Freedom Court Reporting. I think uh, Ramonica Carney is also here from the Dothan uh, Police Department. It's something that David and I are are committed to. In in in, in Dothan is the uh, Community Watch Program, and Ramonica does a great job with the Community Watch Program. And I know she would welcome the opportunity to to meet everybody and to talk with everybody about what that program is all about. Uh, we uh, also have uh, Ann Cox from Cox Custom uh, Clothier out there and Jim Faust with Wiregrass Investigations and he does a great job uh, in, 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 with uh, Wiregrass Investigations and I would encourage everyone to stop by and uh, meet them and again I thank y'all for the opportunity to share this uh, information with you today.